Hello and welcome to the Getting Started with Specflow video series. My name is Bas Dijkstra. In the fifth and final part of this video series, we're going to take a closer look at how you can work effectively with tables in Specflow. In the previous video in this series, we've seen how you can use scenario outlines with example tables to remove duplication in your scenarios and clean up your feature files. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at how you can use tables to pass more complex data as an argument to steps in Specflow. Often, simply passing individual parameters to your step definitions is not enough to express the behavior that you want, and you need a way to express more complex data structures in your feature files. And as we've already briefly discussed in the previous video, Specflow allows you to pass tables as arguments to individual steps as well. Now, since there's no limit to the amount of table columns and table rows you can pass as a parameter to a spec flow step, it might be tempting to use a lot of columns to express every single piece of data that you want to use in your step definition implementation so as to create step definitions that are highly reusable. However, you should always keep in mind that using spec flow and expressing behavior through scenarios and feature files is meant to create living documentation of the system that we're building. And this means that readability of your steps and your scenarios is extremely important. And when you use a lot of columns in your table arguments in your steps, readability will quickly decline. In the previous video, I already introduced a rule of thumb that you could use to decide whether or not to include a specific column or a specific piece of data in a data table. If a specific value is important to the outcome of the scenario, by all means do specify it. But if a parameter or a specific value does not have a direct effect on the behavior that's being described or on the outcome of the scenario that is listed in our feature file, it's probably better not to include it in your step definition directly, but instead to assign a value to that parameter in the implementation of your step definition and thereby hide it from the scenario. And as a result, you'll end up with cleaner steps, cleaner scenarios and much, much better readability. Let's take a quick look at an example in Specflow here. I want to add a number of places for an existing country code and existing zip code. Now, because the data that I want to add has a somewhat more complex structure, I chose to use a table to pass the arguments to the step definition. This is a table with four columns and four rows and each of the four columns represents a field in the data structure that is needed to add a specific location data to the repository. As you can see, the values in the final column for each of the rows is the same. The country name is Germany for all four places that I want to add to the location repository. Furthermore, this information can also be inferred from the fact that I'm using a country code DE, which is the international country code for Germany. And this is a perfect example of a case where explicitly specifying data in a table as an argument to a step is probably not the best idea. Instead, in cases like this, I would advise you to remove or exclude this column from your table and specify or infer this value somewhere in the implementation of your step definition. And as you can see, when we remove this column from our table, our table gets smaller, our scenario and our feature file immediately becomes easier to read and that's what using spec flow and creating living documentation is all about. So now that we've seen how you can specify table arguments to steps in your spec flow scenarios, we'll also need a way to use them effectively in our step definition implementations. Now technically we every time we use a table argument to a step, we could write an intricate piece of logic that allows us to go through each individual column and in each individual row of the table argument, then keep track of the names of the columns, for each step that we want to perform in our step definition, look up the value in the specific column for that specific row and act accordingly. But as you probably understand from this explanation, this will make your step definition code incredibly complex, hard to read and hard to maintain. 
to help you deal more effectively with table arguments and remove that boilerplate code that is needed to parse and process values in table cells by hand, Specflow offers a table support library called specflow.assist. Specflow.assist offers a number of methods that can be used to convert table rows to C-sharp objects as well as to compare C-sharp objects to table rows, which means that Specflow.assist can be used both using given steps where you maybe supply some data that specifies the initial state for a specific scenario, as well as compare the outcome of an action that you performed in your application under test with values in a predefined table in your scenario in a then step. In this video I want to highlight four key specflow assist methods. The four most important specflow.assist methods are the compare to instance method where you can compare a single table row to an object and by compare I mean comparing the actual values of fields in a C-sharp object with the values that are specified in a specflow table row without having to explicitly name all of the individual fields. The compare to set method does the same as the compare to instance method but for an entire table so not for an individual table row and a single C-sharp object but for an entire table and a list of C-sharp objects of a specific type. The create instance method can be used in, for example, in the implementation of a given step to convert a table row into an object and automatically map all of the values that are specified in the tables to the correct properties, to the correct fields of that C-sharp object. And finally, and this probably doesn't come as a surprise, specflow.assist also offers a create set method where you can do the same as you did with the create instance method, but instead of creating an individual C-sharp object from an individual table row, with create set you can convert an entire specflow table to a list of C-sharp objects all in one go, just with a single line of code. Let's take a look at how specflow.assist works in practice. I have another scenario here and in this scenario I use a specflow table as an argument to the then step to specify the details for a list of location results and the purpose of this step is to compare the values, the expected values that are in this table to the actual values that are returned by my zip code API. The zip code API returns a list of places associated with a given country and zip code, in this case DE and 24848 and again I could potentially write a very intricate step definition implementation that goes through the JSON response filters out all of the places and then compares each individual place to a row and the corresponding fields in this table but instead let's take a look at how the methods in specflow.assist make our life a lot easier here the first thing I need is an object that represents that data structure and in this example that's a place class. This place class has five fields, five properties, a place name, a longitude, a state, a state abbreviation and a latitude. Now I'm not interested here for the reasons that I explained earlier in this video in the actual values of the state or the state abbreviation. The only fields that matter to me are the place name, the longitude and the latitude. So those are the values that are specified in my specflow table. And here we see the implementation of our step definition. And the important line here is line number 60. Now in the lines just above, I deserialize the JSON response from the API into a location response object. That location response object has a property places, which is a list of place objects. And that's the place object we just saw. So location response dot places contains a list of place objects and with a single call to the compare to set method that's provided by specflow.assist I can compare this list of place objects to the table that we specified as an argument to this step which is stored in the expected places parameter. Now what the single line of code does is for each row in the 
table that contains the expected places. It goes through the list, the collection of place objects that's being returned by the API. And it checks if there is a place in that list of places that matches the value specified in that table row. And I don't have to specify individual fields individual table columns, individual properties. Specflow.assist does this for me. It checks whether there is a property in the object that matches the column name in our specflow table. If it finds a match, it checks if the value in that specflow table column matches the value of the specific property of that place object. And it does this for all rows and all columns in our specflow table. And this gives me an extremely flexible and powerful way of comparing table contents to collections of data objects without having to write a lot of complex code that performs these comparisons for me. So let's run the scenarios in this feature and see what happens. So this is the scenario that contains the then step with the tables that we just discussed. And as you can see, this scenario passes. It actually invokes the API. It deserializes the JSON response into a list of place objects. And for each individual table row in the then step in our scenario, it checks if there's a matching occurrence in the collection of places. Now this passing test execution result doesn't tell you a whole lot. So let's quickly make a change to our expected values to get a better view of what specflow.assist actually does. So making a small change to the table that contains the expected data for the places, let's just make a small change to one of the expected place names. And now let's run the feature file again. And you can see that once we've change the expected outcome, suddenly the execution of this scenario indicates a failure. And if we take a closer look at the detail, the test detail summary, we can see exactly what is the power of specflow.assist. If we look at the message that is returned by specflow.assist, we see that it throws a comparison exception and it even indicates for which rows in the table no suitable match was found in the list of places that was returned by the API. And remember, this is the line that we changed. We changed the place name from crop to crop. And specflow.assist indicates, well, I didn't find a place with a place name crop with a specific longitude and latitude. So there's a potential issue there. Yet I did find a place name called crop with a specific longitude and latitude. And that also might be a potential issue. So specflow.assist both indicates when rows in the specified tables that were missing in the collection of objects, as well as objects in the collection of objects for which there was no row in the specflow table. So this gives you an extremely detailed overview of the differences between a complex data structure expressed in a specflow scenario and the corresponding data structures expressed in C -sharp objects. So to summarize this video, tables are an extremely powerful feature of SpecFlow that allows you to express complex data structures in a readable format in your scenarios and in your feature files. And specflow.assist is a very useful and powerful library to help you deal with those tables in your step definition implementations and create C-sharp objects from them or compare them to an existing C-sharp object or collection of objects. As always, if you have any questions about or feedback on what we've discussed in this video, please do not hesitate to get in touch. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you soon.